a few interesting topics that we need to explore tonight. Yeah, first of all, Ringgit extends rally. Um, I think for the entire year itself, we've been talking about the Ringgit weakening, Ringgit, you know, depreciating against the US dollar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And more recently, in fact, in a few weeks, uh, the Ringgit has continued to rally against not just the US dollar, but other major currencies as well. But uh, quite a lot of people are sort of turning a blind eye towards that. Uh, and I just want to talk about the real reasons why we are suddenly seeing this uh, uh, ringgit strength. Yeah, next up, we'll move on over to the importance of work-life balance. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, they think this is important, but employers, they tend to misunderstand the importance of work-life balance. They'll be like, oh, let me just slap a, a fixed work hour, maybe 9 to 5, and expect you to work OT a bit without paying you. And that's all. It's already kind of balanced already. But it's actually more than that. And lastly, we will settle on understanding PIDM protection and cash apps. Now, I am sure the majority of you who have followed the Futurist for quite some time, you may be investing or putting your money into uh, one of these cash apps uh, like Versa, Gold Plus, yeah, Touch and Go, Go Invest, uh, Stash Away, KDI Safe. And a lot of people still think that you know all these cash apps, they are insured by PIDM. And that's contrary to popular belief. Uh. So we'll discuss... What actually is PIDM's protection plus what you need to know about all these uh, cash apps? Okay? So this and more in our weekly analysis, as usual, not financial or legal advice. Huh? And a quick shout out to all our learners and gatherers, our patrons. Thank you all so much for your support. Allow me to start with Andrew, Wendy, Edward, Alex, CC, Is, Morpheus, Urshad, Caveman, Balls, Kelvin, Kai, Thien, Tommy, Jing Kang, Adrian, Eric, JS, Wen Yen, Dean, Duhan, Ken, and Farius, as well as all of our learner members. So without further ado, dive right into this week's topic. Ringgit continues to rally. Uh, um, if you take a look at the US dollar MYR chart over here, you can see how impressive the rally has been already. Okay, uh, In fact, in the past 18 days alone, uh, ever since 12 July itself, right? The US dollar has fallen by from peak to trough, uh, 3.17%. And not only against the US dollar, right, but if you take a look at uh, other major currencies, like the one we always compare to, yeah, Singapore dollar, right? We are at 3.42 right now. Yeah, previously on the 12th of July, uh, 18 to 20 days ago, uh, the Sing dollar hit an all-time high of 3.50, which got a lot of people worried. Then right now it's gradually strengthening back, uh, similarly to the US dollar, so about two to three percent. Uh, next up, the pound sterling, which also a lot of people tend to compare with. We are currently at 5.85, where uh, 18 to 20 days ago, I hit a seven-year low of 6.04. Okay, so there is quite a bit of ringgit strength that we are seeing. And uh, a lot of people got kind of excited and they are saying that, hey, the recent ringgit strength is from Bank Negara Malaysia. Okay, because late last month, uh, the central bank decided to announce that they will intervene in the currency market to stem excessive currency movements. But upon doing further research, I found out that this is not the case. Yeah, ringgit strength is certainly not from Bank Negara Malaysia because uh, you guys can also just really do a quick Google search over here. Yeah, Just Google search Bank Negara Malaysia foreign currency reserves you'll be able to come up with the most recent balance sheet of the central bank and you'll be able to see right as of 30th of june just days after they made the announcement their foreign currency reserves stood at 99.2 billion us dollars so half a month later yeah, about two weeks later as of 14th of july the foreign currency reserves state level at 99.2 us dollars yeah, 99.2 billion us dollars so this is clear evidence that um, Bank Nagara Malaysia has really spent a lot of their reserves to intervene in the currency market. Because if we are seeing if Bank Nagara Malaysia is the reason for the ringgit strength, then this figure should be substantially or significantly lower. Maybe minus 1 billion to 5 billion ringgit, or sorry, 5 billion dollars, somewhere along those lines. And we're not seeing that. Okay, uh, which lets, leads me to believe or leads me to go and research other reasons as to why uh, the ringgit has suddenly strengthened. So the first reason that uh, I can come up with is that the Federal Reserve on Wednesday approved an interest rate hike that takes interest rates to the highest level in more than 22 years. So read the pointers over here. Uh, the 25 basis point rate hike brought the federal funds rate or the interest rate to a target range of 5.25 to 5.5%. 
Now, within the meeting itself, right, Chairman, Chairman Jerome Powell, he said that the central bank will make data-driven decisions on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting basis. So the Federal Reserve is still keeping the door open in terms of future rate hikes, but the markets are pricing in the reverse. Okay, so while policymakers indicated at the June meeting that two rate hikes are coming this year, markets are pricing in a better than even chance that there won't be any more moves this year. Okay, so um, if you understand why currencies fluctuate, right, and that's due to supply and demand, which is mainly driven by the difference of interest rates between countries, uh, it then becomes clear why the US dollar has rallied so much in 2022 itself, because the Federal Reserve has been aggressively raising interest rates much more aggressive compared to other global uh, central banks globally. Okay, So compared to Malaysia, uh, you're quite clear of the OPR already from 1.75% in May last year to the current level of 3.0%. Okay, Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve from 0.25% all the way to the current level, 5.25%, 5.5%. Right? So obviously that drove a lot of demand towards the US dollar. But right now, the end is in sight already. Okay, So the Fed, even though they left the door open for more rate hikes, markets pricing in the reverse, majority of investors believe that the Fed will keep rates steady at its next meeting and possibly for the rest of the year. Yeah, you take a look at this uh, probability analysis from CME Group, right? Over 78% of investors believe that in the Federal Reserve's next meeting, they will hold interest rates steady yeah, at 525 to 550 basis points, and even for the rest of the year itself. And this forecast has really weakened the US dollar. Okay, you can see over here, right after the Federal Reserve announced its interest rate hikes, and even though they say that, hey, the door is still open, we're not looking to pause, we're going to be more data-driven just here, we don't need to conclude anything, but markets are trying to predict the future. Okay, markets are pricing in the reverse, uh, which is why you see the US dollar index, which tracks the strength of the greenback to other major currencies such as the yen, uh, euro, as well as Chinese yuan, right? has weakened quite a bit, yeah, 0 0.3 to 0.5% on Thursday to Friday itself. Now, this is one of the uh, reasons as to why we are suddenly seeing the ringgit's uptick. Okay? Another reason is that uh, foreign funds, they are returning to Malaysia. Actually, they are making quite an aggressive comeback to our market. You can see the chart over here. Net foreign fund flows into Malaysian equities since July 2021. Uh, 2023 itself hasn't been really a good year for the Malaysian market. Lah. Okay, if you're investing in the Busa market, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, the start of the year, two previous few weeks, it's really quite bad. You buy a stock, it just goes down and down and down. It, yeah, that's because foreigners they have been heavily selling in the local market, but suddenly in this past two weeks alone, they turned into net buyers on Busa Malaysia, acquiring almost 750 million ringgit equities. Now, some of you may say that, hey, this is not buying the Malaysian ringgit. Right? This is just buying Malaysian equities. But how does it strengthen the Malaysian ringgit? But if you think of it logically, right, in order to enter into Malaysian equities, they have to first acquire Malaysian ringgit first. Okay, so this in itself has driven quite a bit of demand towards the uh, Malaysian ringgit, which could explain uh, part of the ringgit strength also. La. Largest net inflow since February 2022 and the returning interest from foreigners marks a significant shift in sentiment, especially after they've been dumping equities for 12 consecutive weeks previously, you can see here. Right? And uh, the entire year of 2023 itself, I think 22 out of 27 weeks this year have been heavy selling from them. So for them to suddenly come back and make a gigantic buy or gigantic entry over here, right? it's uh, not just only good for the Malaysian market, but it also driven to ring it upward stuff, okay? So government reveals investments, yeah, coincidentally on Thursday as well, which is uh, one of the days where the ringgit has made quite a big move upwards, uh, is when PM Anwar announced the Madani economy framework. Okay, basically it's just, um, it's more like a, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it a mini budget, but it's like a plan with the aim of boosting Malaysia's economy and better the lives of people. So economy minister Rafizi Ramli, he said that, the Prime Minister unveiled investments amounting to 25 billion ringgit. And this initiative, apart from being yet another driver towards the ringgit strength, will be able to create a better business environment, attract more investors, both foreign direct investment and local investors to invest in Malaysia. 
and the cards start to line up, right? When you take a look at this news itself, you will understand why foreigners probably, why they are suddenly, you know, aggressively returning back into the Malaysian market itself. Okay, so I think these are so far the reasons that I'm looking at uh, as to why the ringgit has strengthened. Like, I may have missed a couple of reasons because, you know, currencies fluctuate due to a variety of reasons. Uh, we can't just look at one reason, like Bank Nagara Malaysia intervening in the foreign currency market and say that, hey, this is the main reason. Right? We have to look at uh, across the market, what is the uh, multiple reasons that we're seeing towards the ringgit strength. But it is clear that the recent uptake that we're seeing is not due to Bank Nagara Malaysia. Yeah? Because the central bank, they only have the firepower to temporarily, you know, or perhaps control the volatility of the ringgit on a day-to-day -day basis, ensure that we don't see big 5, 10, 15% swings, okay? They don't have the firepower to affect the ringgit strength in the long term. Yeah, that one needs to come from uh, government policies as well as uh, fiscal policies, okay? So uh, on to the ne next topic over here. It's also quite interesting. Work-life balance matters. I recently came across this survey. Now, this is uh, Randstad's employer brand researcher, and they surveyed over 2,500 Malaysian respondents, 32 markets. And these respondents, they are between the age of 18 to 64. The purpose of the survey itself is to take a look at the current sentiment of Malaysian employees and see how they feel with the work environment, etc., etc. And the majority of them, they agree that work-life balance is crucial. You can see over here, challenges in the country's economy and labor market over the past three years added a new dimension to workers' priorities and expectations. The survey shows that while an attractive salary and benefits continue to be a top priority for job seekers, they also want a company that offers work-life balance. Okay, so uh, flexible working hours, the ability to work hybrid, etc., etc. And in fact, over half of the people, 50% uh, of respondents surveyed, uh, said that they will leave their current job to fulfill this objective. Okay, so the second and third reasons uh, is lack of career growth opportunities, low compensation and rising cost of living. And bear in mind, uh, the importance of work-life balance right, is so adhered to right, or so deferred right, that uh, they, are, they are even thinking about this is despite the rising cost of living and inflation. Uh, okay? So other pointers over here, different generations, different work priorities. Each generation has its own distinct motivations that drive them to search for a new employer, but all of these generations, they value work-life balance over other motivations. Yeah? Gen Zs, Millennials, Gen Xs, you can see, right? Their preference towards work-life balance is much more higher compared to the second and third motivations, okay? What makes an ideal employer? Yeah, obviously, a top reason is still attractive salary and benefits. You know, that's because of the cost of living as well as inflation over here, okay? But the second reason comes in with a uh, good work-life balance. Many companies, they've taken steps to support their employees' work-life balance over the past year, which is good news. Yeah, employees, they are taking good initiatives. Employees are beginning to have a healthier work-life balance as a result of improved communications and more manageable workloads and wellness initiatives. Yeah, but there's still quite a bit of employers out there. They are still trying to you know, exploit a lot of employees, uh, which makes them feel a bit demotivated. Okay? So the next data over here is that uh, non-monetary benefits and 87% uh, of respondents, they find this benefit extremely important. Okay, if you take a look at the talent movement in Malaysia right now, almost two in 10 people, yeah, they have changed jobs between July and December 2022. Yeah, one in third of Malaysians, they're planning to switch jobs this year. And the reason for them to switch jobs, right, is because they are afraid to lose their jobs. Yeah, this is a bit conflicting, uh, but if you dig deeper, the reason becomes quite clear. The fear of job loss motivates people to search for an employer that offers better job security or an opportunity to upskill to stay employable. Okay, so the reason why people are planning to switch jobs is so that they can look for a more stable and more uh, work-life balanced job. Okay. So next up, why do employees desire hybrid work? Yeah, 23% of Malaysians, they say that they will leave their current jobs due to long commute times. And not just long commute times, right? A lot of uh, additional expenses come from working in the office or so. Yeah, they'll be able to save money if they work from home on commuting, meals, and other work-related expenses as well. Okay? And the hybrid working also improves employees' well-being 
as there is more flexibility and control over their schedules. Okay, 96% over here, you can see, uh, prioritize flexible work. Right? Their expectations for upskilling and reskilling, 83% of Malaysians, they say it is important to grow, but only 61% say that they have adequate develop development opportunities. Yeah, this is contrary to popular belief. Uh, a lot of employers that think that, you know, Malaysian employees, they're quite lazy. They just want to earn good salary and that's it. Yeah, they just want to go back on time, etc., etc. But, you know, a lot of people, they still want to progress along their career. They're still interested to improve. It's just that they don't have the uh, adequate development opportunities, okay? Three in five respondents say they have enough opportunities to develop in their current role. However, this also means that 39% either feel indifferent or experience a lack of development opportunities in their roles. So all in all, uh, this survey itself, let me just reverse back to the main picture, really highlights the importance of work-life balance in the current environment. Okay, so uh, if you're an employer out there, or if you're an employee, maybe this might be the best time to voice out to your you know, employer or to your boss how you would like your work-life balance to be structured. Uh, because nobody wants to work from 9 to 9 and then you know, work OT again without getting paid, okay? Because this is not that that generation anymore. It is really a different era. Okay, right now, let's move on to uh, something quite interesting also, what you need to know about cash apps. Yeah, Versa, Touch & Go, Go Plus, Touch & Go, Go Invest, Stash Away, KDI Safe. These are the, these are the cash apps that, can, that I can name on the top of my head. Uh. And uh, all of these apps, right, they give, they're giving quite attractive returns. One or two years ago, right, Touch and Go's Gold Plus, right, was only giving you 1% to 2% returns. Now, it's already 3.5% already. Okay, and Versa, yeah, that's the highest return so far, 4.3% like per annum. And the important thing that you're going to know about these cash apps, which I'm sure, you know, quite a lot of pe people have been putting their money into it, is that your money is typically invested into MMFs. Yeah, it stands for Money Market Funds. And MMFs, in turn, they invest in short-term debt securities such as government bonds and commercial paper. They are deemed as highly stable and low risk because technically you are lending the money to the government, right? And the Malaysian government is, yeah, they'll pay back their debts, okay? They're deemed, quote-unquote, quite stable, okay? So Versa itself, uh, every single app, whenever you invest in a cash app, right? Whenever you put your money into a cash app, right? You can see where specifically your money goes to, okay? So go within the app itself, and then check out fund prospectus or fund information, okay? As for Versa Cash, your money goes to the Afin Huang Enhanced Deposit Fund, Go Plus, Principal E-Cash Fund, uh, Go Invest, Principal Islamic Money Market Fund. For Stash Away, it is eSpring Investments Islamic Income Fund. And all these money market funds, right, they give quite decent returns, yeah, 4 to 5%, and they are also quite flexible. Yeah, this is why cash apps allow you the flexibility to basically deposit and withdraw anytime, right? But the big risk over here, or perhaps the big, you know, red flag, one of the red flags over here, is that cash apps are not insured by PIDM. Yeah, a lot of people still believe that their money within cash apps is insured, but uh, that's contrary to popular belief. Uh, it's not insured by PIDM. Uh. To understand uh, what is specifically covered by PIDM, you can just really quickly do a Google search and take a look at their prospectus, their breakdown. Okay, so typically, uh, you get a 250,000 ringgit coverage per depositor per member bank, okay? And the uh, deposit products or accounts protected by PIDM include savings, current, fixed deposits accounts, okay? And within here itself, you can basically expand your benefits and maximize your benefits over here. Like I can see Adam, Adam and wife, Adam Leong and Co, how he, has, how he is able to maximize the PIDM protection. So in this case, let's say you open your account with Maybank, right? Savings, current and fixed deposit account. Now, all of these are individuals, individual accounts. In that case, you can only get up to 250,000. Okay, so you are lacking a 50,000 ringgit coverage over here. But if you open a joint account within the same bank itself, you get an additional 250,000 protection. Now, so separate deposit accounts each have their own uh, 250K protection. Okay. What is not protected? Yeah, investment accounts, unit trusts, stocks and shares, goal-related investment products, deposits not payable in Malaysia. Generally, right, when a product has the word invest or investment in it, right, it is most likely not protected by PIDM. Okay? 
And this also goes to uh, products like ASB and ASM. Yeah. So take note, uh, ASB, Amana Sama Bui Putra, ASM, Amana Sama Malaysia, they are not protected by PIDM. Okay. So uh, the notion of PIDM protection, yeah, this is just to, you know, uh, not to scare you guys, uh, but this is the truth. Uh, okay. PIDM protection is more psychological than mathematical uh, because if you take a look at uh, their balance sheet, right? Their total assets is only 5.9 billion ringgit. Okay. So compared to the major banks out there, like major banks out there like Maybank, Public Bank, etc. etc., the assets that they hold, right, or their total assets right, is almost trillions of ringgit. Yeah. So essentially, if a bank run were to truly occur, right, PIDM they don't have sufficient liquidity to cover all depositors, right? But they have the uh, ability to temporarily borrow money from Bank Negara Malaysia. La. Okay, so touch wood, let's say a major bank falls. Okay, let's say tomorrow or something like that. Don't want to say which bank. Uh, PIDM has the capability to take over the bank itself and then liquidate its assets to pay back investors. After that, if it's still not enough, then they can borrow money from Bank Negara Malaysia. But you should understand that the total assets held by PIDM is only 5.9 billion million. So, this protection itself is more like a psychological guarantee. It's like a, hey guys, you know, don't bank run. This is just a certificate that uh, this bank is protected by PIDM. But actually, we don't really have the assets to back it. But anyway, guys, don't panic. Okay, so uh, that's PIDM protection in a nutshell to you guys. Lah. Thank you guys for joining tonight's session and uh, hopefully to see you guys in the next one. All right, guys. Bye. Good night. See you.